you know, if you wanted, I don't know, some people like to put together a PowerPoint. Did you do anything like that or? Um... No, no, I, I didn't, but um, okay. no worries. Yeah. That's fine. We've got, everything should be good on my end, so. Okay, we'll just wait a couple more minutes before we get started and then. Um... Cool, I, I wish I'd have known. I would have put a little something together for you guys. No, it's totally fine. Yeah, doing it off the, I mean, it's, uh, that's how a lot of people do it anyway. They just, you know, see where the questions take them instead of trying to have something together and then not being able to finish half of it. So Yeah. Uh, well, I try and be an open book and, uh, and I'm ADD. So we'll see where this takes me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look forward to the rabbit holes. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There, there are a lot of them. And there's like a good 60% chance that my son busts in here. I was, was going to say time. same. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So, um, it's, it's so funny. I, um, he goes to daycare a couple of times a week. Whenever I pick him up, he just runs full speed and sprints and tackles me. And he always has something to tell me. The last two days have been, Daddy, I peed in the potty. And then, like, tackles me. So <laughs> that's uh, a big achievement. Yeah, it is, man. Uh, supposedly he went five times. And I'm like, dude, like, how much water are you drinking a day? <laughs> so, is he getting any rewards for it? Has he figured that out? Man, um, it, it's this is probably a hot uh, a hot topic for for parents, but he <laughs> had to for a while. I'm like, yeah. man, like if you go, like I'll give you a potty Skittle or a potty M and M, a bowl of Skittles or M and M's. So like, yeah, dude, here's some candy. Um, you just powdered water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> 100%. I know the game. <laughs> um funny enough when i picked him up and he says the weirdest things and like sometimes he can get dark he's like daddy you're not a good daddy and i'm like well wyatt if i am not a good daddy would i have brought you sour patch kids and he goes <laughs> daddy you're a very good daddy <laughs> <laughs> I'm like all right man i get yeah. it <laughs> it's like a fiddle yeah i did 100 percent and uh, you know, I should look out for it, but it still gets me. Joanna, my wife is the weak one. Let me tell you, though. <laughs> this is recorded. Yeah, well, it's all right. She, 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 I, I'm already in the doghouse. So, no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, she knows it. She knows it. Um, uh, well, if you guys are ready, we can go ahead and get started. Sure. Yeah. Here, Jason? Okay. Well, uh, welcome, everybody. Today, we have Jason McGee uh, speaking on real estate investing with a full-time job. Um, before we get started and uh, Mateus introduces Jason, we're going to have just a couple little things. Um, first is our net, our announcement for our next meetup. Uh, that's going to be November 18th. Uh, so that's the third Wednesday in November from 6 to 8 p.m. And then um, this month we'll have the market report with Mateus. So I've got this up here for you. Um, let me see. Apologize. This is a free event, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Here's your the market report, and this is yeah. for Harrisonburg and Rockingham County. I guess so one of the big things for Harrisonburg and Rockingham County is obviously we saw a decrease of uh, sales during COVID uh, or the, the start of COVID. I shouldn't say it's over. Um, and we've, we've caught up, we surpassed, um, the pace of sales anyway for, for this time at, in 2019. So that's awesome. Um, the median sales price is up, uh, the inventory, inventory levels are down by 46%. Um, Jeez. so at the end of August, we had 149 houses for sale. And I've been saying that inventory has been an issue for the past like three years. Um, and so to be down 46%, mm. um, on an already low inventory, year of 2019 is just crazy. Um, median days on the market seven. Um, it was 12 in September of 2019. Um, 150 houses sold in September. Uh, we're at a total of 1,049 house sales from January to September 2019. Um, that compares to 1,019 and this at that point in uh, 2019. So that's doing that we, we've surpassed 2019. Um, median sales price from January to September was, uh, 240,900, which compares to 2019, nine, that's up 10%. Um, and then the median days in the market from January to September was 11, um, compared to 18 in 2019. So, uh, the market is going strong. 
Um, if you're a buyer, inventory or the interest rates are so low, which is great. Finding a property can be difficult. Um, I've often told people that, you know, if you can find the property and yes, you're probably paying a little bit more for it if, you know, the median sales price is 10% more, but locking in that interest rate for 30 years is going to be that purchase price is going to be a lot less in like 10 if you have a sub 3% interest rate. So um, definitely opportunities. If you're a seller, it's opportunities for both buyers and sellers. Um, it's just easier if you're a seller. Okay, perfect. And um, so we're getting ready to turn over to Jason McGee. Um, Jason is a real estate investor who has a full-time job too. So he's really focusing on building his portfolio and um, having more of a passive stance on it. So he's got property managers, he's, he's doing everything remotely and he's in a, a multifamily syndication in Texas. So I'm just gonna turn it over to you, Jason, and you can talk a little bit about your experiences and how you're doing everything and, and your, your processes for getting everything done. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, obviously, um, as I as I joked, um, I can go on some tangents. So any questions that pop up, uh, let me know. Uh, Matthias, it's really good to to actually get fully linked back up with you, man. We uh, obviously went to school together and went our separate ways and somehow real estate's brought us back together, which is which is very ironic. Um, yeah, pretty uh, wild. You were in Austin when we first kind of linked back up about real estate, right? Yeah, yeah, that that's it. Um, so I guess I'll I'll give you just a little bit of background about me. Um, went to school, uh, James Madison. Um, uh, after graduated JMU with, in international business uh, as my degree in marketing, I lived up in Northern Virginia for a while. At that point, wasn't investing in, in real estate up until probably the last year I was there. Uh, we can get into that, but then moved to Austin, Texas. Knowing that I wasn't going to be in Austin, Texas, I promised my wife we'd be there for one year. One year turned into three. So, you know, eventually came back to, to Charlottesville, Virginia, which is just as close as I would get to, to, um, to you know, close enough to family, but also still, I, I love Charlottesville. Um, yeah. So um, I guess in, as we mentioned, the headline of this, obviously work a full-time job. Uh, I, I run... Uh, sales and business development for uh, an AI company that helps uh, online brands and retailers sell them on on Walmart and Amazon. Um, but a little bit about real estate is it's like so cliche. Uh, my dad had me reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad and all these other things when, when, when I was a kid. Ironically, he was an investor himself, but I think he took the stance like, hey, if I had to go and do it all over again, like think about moving away from the being an employee like it's uh, or you know not just fully buck yourself but you have the employee uh component you have the uh self-employed component and then you have the investor where your money is working for you and you never really pushed me into real estate but you know just doing a lot of digging and, and researching uh, i i sort of caught the bug when when you go through um like what are the main reasons you want like uh like want to do real estate. I saw the failure rate with a lot of startups, you know, in the 95% plus range. And there's just a lot of ambiguity in, 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 in a lot of ways, a lot of lack of control. Um, but the thing I like about real estate is so cliche, right? You have your loan pay down, which pay, especially for long-term investors, um, mm -hmm. your loan pay down, which obviously is just building your net worth every single month. Uh, appreciation. I call it the icing on the cake. I personally would not buy a property uh, banking on uh, appreciation just because, I mean, Matthias, when we were, you know, graduating from school, we're coming out of the worst economic recession, certainly of our lifetime. And, and that's never, uh, appreciation's paper money, in my opinion. Um, then cash flow has been big for me. And then, and then um, uh, obviously the tax components as well. Um, in terms of how I got into it, um, when we were living in Northern Virginia, um, I, we knew that eventually we'd probably be in Charlottesville. So we actually were looking to buy a single family home that my wife and I would move into. Um, and then honestly, I have to credit, uh, bigger pockets a lot. I was, uh, I listened to a lot of their, uh, re read a lot of their blogs, listened to a lot of their recordings. And then the opportunity comes, it came up where, actually, you know, 
Joanna's grandparents uh, lived in a duplex and they were actually about to move and the opportunity came up for us to actually buy that. So uh, that was our first deal. It was a duplex that we still own today in, in Harrisonburg. Um, one thing I would say about that is like you really need, especially if you have a little bit of time in a day, you have to be very purposeful for your, uh, with your time. But I think it's actually pretty remarkable if you set your, 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 your sights on something all of a sudden, it's kind of like you want to buy a Honda. You see all the Hondas on the road. Right. If you want to buy real estate um, and you really take the initiatives and take the action, you start to see opportunities that you never would have seen before as well. So I think that was that was a really important aspect. Um, uh, and I know, oh, go ahead, sorry. Well, I think that's an interesting point. I've definitely talked to people that have, um, that probably... There, I think there's a spectrum a little bit on that. Like, I think there's probably some people that are like a hundred percent. That's all they think about when they want to start buying something. They're just like, you know, constantly checking. And then I think there's people that like kind of forget, especially if it's an investment that they're thinking about doing one day and maybe are a little more timid on it. So do you think it was, where would you think you would fall on that kind of like? It's funny, man. Um, I think here, my, here, my school of thought is like you have again a lot of what i say is cliche and there's a reason why pe they call them cliches because a lot of people reference it like when i when i also when you think about being purposeful for your time that also comes with purposeful action uh derived from goals so for me my goal was it was 2015 at the time i was like by the end of this year i want to buy one property that is my focus i'm not going to try and cook it and, and say something like, i'm going to have you know, a hundred doors in, in, in a year. Like I just made it very simple, straightforward. And mm -hmm. I set a very narrow focus on that. So my goal was by the end of this year, I'm going to have one property. Um, and that's how it started. And then um, with me, like now I have seven doors. I have, uh, I, I guess, an order of when I purchased them just to give some background about how I've sort of built this up. Um, Started with two uh, a duplex, so two doors in Harrisonburg. Then I bought two separate townhouses that were on the same street in um, in Norfolk, Virginia, like the Virginia Beach area. Um, so that was 2015. I bought the first one. 2017 is when I bought the other two. Um, then in 2018, I actually bought um, two more townhouses in Harrisonburg. And then I also, per and then 2018 also purchased a single family house that we also were looking at from a rental perspective, because I know it wasn't going to be our forever home. And then the, the last one, which was 2019 last year, is I bought a townhouse in Virginia Beach. And then I have a, a, a duplex under contract right now. So for me, like, I think if you set really audacious goals, I think it's, it's very important. And I think you should think big. But I think you also need to have a realistic element, which is like, if I want to balance having a family and working full time and giving it my attention, just set goals that I know are going to make sure I drive to hit baseline action. So that's, that's right. been my strategy. And it sounds like they're very attainable things that you can actually get, you know, you can make progress on and, and that's awesome. And it's kind of interesting because you like the, the traditional, like my first rental was my first house. Um, which I think a lot of people tuning in might use or like thinking about, you know, working with a full investing with a full-time job. Um, you did that like what five in or, <laughs> or did you live in the first duplex or is that just a dude? It's actually a really good point. I, I think it's really easy for people to, I mean, for me, it was like, I'm not going to own a home. Like, Work, from a work perspective, I was like a hired gun, right? I knew I was going to be in Northern Virginia for a while. I knew it was going to be Texas, but I was like, you know what? If I sit here and wait, they say my first investment is going to be a property I live in. I'm not going to get it done. Right. So I actually went, that's actually a good point. I went a much harder route, which is buying a property in a town I didn't even live in at the time, but I had a local support system that I knew could get the job done. Um, sure. So uh, I, I, I think number one thing for me, like, it's sort of chicken to the egg and this is probably one of my tangents, but um, everybody talks to you, do you secure like the deal or the team first? I honestly think if like, if you secure the deal that gives you a good, at least a month, oftentimes two months to assemble a team that you need to do. And for me, it was, I, I, I built in property management 
so I knew they're going to be able to, I had incoming tenants that, uh, that I knew were good tenants from their history. So I had the tenants, I hired a property manager so they can take care of all, obviously all the accounting and any, any of the repairs that need to be done as well. So that's, th that was like the basis of the team that I needed to do to get that deal over the line. I already had my sights on it. But again, I didn't, I, I still haven't lived a hair, in Harrisonburg to this day um, since I was in college. And I, I only own one property where I, in the town that I actually live in. <laughs> so I, I guess too, like, uh, it sounds like you got, you said you got that when you were in Texas, your first deal. First deal, first, deal I was, I was, first deal, I was actually in Virginia about to move to Texas. I was in Northern okay. Virginia and Arlington about to move to Texas. God, well, that's, yeah, it's still remote. So like, um, I feel like that'd be a hurdle for a lot of people mentally is investing somewhere they don't live. Since you're still, you're going remote, you have some in Nor uh, Norfolk, you have some in Virginia Beach, um, your syndication in Texas. How are you, how are you, how did you deal with that the first time? And then how are you assembling your teams too? Well, yeah, so... In, in Harrisonburg, number one thing is just knowing the market. And it doesn't mean you have to physically know every single street. But for me, Harrisonburg was an easy one because I grew up there. I lived there. I knew what I, I knew what it was about. But like, so there, I, I once I had the property, I, I when I did is I actually interviewed property management companies. Um, so there is two or three that I actually went through. I actually got a, had a really good rapport with one. So I knew that they were going to be able to manage this. It was not a problem at all. Um, when I get, when I went to a brand new, the, the toughest thing for me was trying to make a decision for, to buy the properties in Norfolk. So um, luckily what I did is when, when I looked at a new market, what I wanted to see was rent to purchase price ratios. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about the golden one or 2% rule, which is if I purchase a property for a hundred grand, am I going to make at least a thousand dollars a month in rent? So that was my next thing is rent to price ratios um, was very important. Economic development, are there, are there industries or, or jobs that, that are gonna be secured by the fact that there's a lot of infrastructure there? Norfolk made a lot of sense um, because you have Little Creek Naval Base, base there, mm -hmm. um, like a lot of government jobs there as well. Um, so rent to, rent to, uh, uh, rent to rentals of price ratios like my first two properties i purchased outside of the duplex in norfolk were at two percent and, and they still are wow so i mean i'm happy to talk about numbers specifically but before we go down that hole for me it was like i would recommend people make build friendships with wholesalers um or not even that investors who like I have a very good friend of mine who runs a home investors franchise that's actually in the Norfolk area. So they, they go and they buy, you've seen the, we buy ugly houses signs yeah. and stuff like that. A lot of them are flippers. Some of them will flip or some of them will, will be long-term investors. If they do it right. And they're truly invested in it, there's going to be houses that they physically don't have the capital to pay for, or the margins are so tight for them to flip it, but it makes very good sense for a rental and maybe they don't want it for a rental. My number one thing is we all know from a investing perspective, pocket deals or off market listings are going to be the absolute best ones. You just need to go there and connect with the people. So I actually found a lot of the properties, um, some of the ones in the Norfolk area through, through flippers and wholesalers. Um, that, that was, that's number one is deal flow. How do you get deal flow? If you're not going to do mailers, or, and, and, and it's really easy if you wanna do that, it's just a time commitment to do that. Know that if you get a deal from a wholesaler or, 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 or a flipper, et cetera, uh, not a flipper, I, I buy it at, from them as a wholesale. They don't flip right. it, like I do the renovations myself. No, I may pay a premium that they're gonna make good on the money. I don't care if the wholesaler makes five, 10, 15, 20, 30 grand, as long as the numbers make sense for me. Right. So my number one thing is deal flow. Like, how do I make sure I have access to deals? Um, I found a very, very good property manager. Also, I have that backed by a few other property managers that I know I could trust. If you find a good property manager, what you do is you obviously have somebody who can manage the book, somebody who can get rentals in. The, they also, they, since they're managing it, they have a vested interest to make sure the repairs are done and they have um, a support bench of, of people who can actually do the work for you. Uh, and also, 
an unsung hero uh, in terms of deal flow is talk to property managers, especially if they're also realtors, because whenever there's a tenant turnover, good property managers ask the tenant if they're looking to sell, that way they can list it. Um, um, they are just, they have their ear to the market. So that's been, that's been very important to sort of check all the boxes like maintenance, uh, leasing, um, finances, et cetera. So you, you also mentioned, um, those other ones in Norfolk, you had to renovate them since you're not seeing any of these, I know you're doing like inspections, right? Do you want to kind of go into that? Like one, how you're, you're buying these side unseen and using the inspection. And then, um, if you have the process where your property manager goes out there, gives them their input and then doing the renovations that need to be done too. Just yeah. Like yeah. Really good point. So I, obviously I'm a stickler. I will never waive an inspection. Uh, I'm just not going to do that. It's not my risk profile. I'm, I'm pretty risk averse. Um, number one thing is as long as you're not throwing out deals, just to throw out random deals. If you have intent to buy a deal, you put an offer on before you even inspect it. Um, you have a contingency of getting an inspection. What I do is if I'm going to work with an inspector, I call them and I want to know how they worked with investors before. Um, like what level of detail do they get? And I actually coach the inspector of what I'm looking for. And I asked him, if, like, and I actually use their knowledge too. Like the one that I'm working, the one that I have on contract, I, I, I interviewed four, uh, three different inspectors. And I'm like, this is an older home. And I tell them, instead of telling them I want to focus, I'm like, hey, what would you do if this were an older home? And I, I hear their, their pitch on what they would look at from an investor's perspective. That perspective, if I, I, I start to build trust and rapport with the inspector. Sure. I, I actually have my property manager go and walk the property during the inspector as well. Um, because if there's a lot of hair on it, there's some major red flags, my property manager isn't going to want to actually manage it as well. Right. Um, they have a vested interest because they're going to make money on it because I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm using their service, but they're also will oftentimes walk it. And then I have the inspector telling me what they think. I have a separate conversation with the property manager to see what they think. And then I just get an estimation of what the property manager expects what the costs might be. And I just have a network of friends I trust, like, hey, does this seem like a good price, et cetera. So um, my process for that too, like I love the Burr methodology. I'm sure we talk, uh, you guys talk about it a lot, buy, rehab, renovate, um, uh, rent, repeat. Um, the ones that I brought, I, I can share some numbers with you. The two town, and this is a, just a different world in, in the Virginia Beach or Norfolk, uh, Portsmouth area. Two properties, I purchased them for 95 uh, grand uh, combined. Oh, wow. I, yeah, wow. so I got the inspection as a part of my banking, like the, the bank I work with, I had to get an appraisal. I knew the appraisal was already at 120 as it was. So I already have a good margin there. And I got an after repair value estimated between 140 and 150. So my, and so now I have my price, it's 95. Ideally want to, what I want to do is I want to take, what's the after repair value, 80% of that. Um, so I can refinance my money and I subtract what all my, my uh, rehab costs were. So I bought it for 95. I needed 12 K worth of work in it. It reappraised for 145. So I bought it for 95, put 12k in to with, with um, to to fix it up. One of them was rented, um, the other one wasn't. So I I put a lot of money to fix up what needed to be fixed. And I knew that if the appraisal came in between 140 and 150, I could refinance. There's a six month seasoning period with my bank where I couldn't just buy it and refinance it. But when I refinance it, I pulled out every single dollar I initially invested in that property. So I ended up doing it for, you know, getting it for my son. <laughs> no offense. Hey, buddy. Hop in here. Grandpa. Uh, Grandpa. Grandpa's, Grandpa's not on this, yes, buddy. He is. Oh, is he? That's what he told oh. Wait. God, son. Get him. Love you, dude. No pants party in the McGee household. <laughs> <laughs> you called it. Yeah, I did. I, I know. It's, uh, I feel bad locking the door, but to be fair, he'd just thump on the door if not. Um, <laughs> yeah, good time for me to pause instead of going on at a tangent. So no, that was all really interesting. Um, and so one question I had, if I can go back a little bit is you 
fell into the that market through a connection, a wholesaler, or what? Did you do research and found that the rent to purchase ratios were good? Uh, yeah. So actually, um, through one of my my best friends, who's um, who owns one of the home best franchises, he was doing a lot of flips, and he was like, right, his model is I'm doing a lot of flips and maybe pick up some rentals that are just, you know, very good. But um, he was like, hey man, here's what I'm seeing in this market right now, you should take a look. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I found the market. But there are a lot of people who put out reports on what good markets are. Okay. Um, instead of, yeah, I try to keep it pretty concise where it's like, all right, like there are a lot of cities in, in the Virginia Beach area. Let's try and isolate that and understand it. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was, um, I will have to give a shout out to, uh, so the reason why I even got in real estate is actually uh, my wife's father, uh, Gary. I believe Gary actually spoke uh, to your real estate meetup. Yeah. Um, to yeah. My, my portion. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think the other thing too is just surrounding yourself by really good people and people that you, you, you know, trust and, and you look up to. And I think he made, he made the jump a lot easier for me to get invested in real estate because I learned a lot from him and just being willing to go out there and ask for help and, and learn as much as you can. So the information's there if you go find it. So when you, when you refied those properties that you're the 95 ones that you said um, you improved them and cashed them out, what, what cash flow are you looking for generally there? Do you have a per door or is it an, like a return on investment cash on cash? Like what are you doing there to make sure it's a good deal? Yeah. My, these are guidelines, but the ones I use is I, I want to get $200 per door. I want to be able to refinance in and pull up either pull out either all my money or as much as I can. Um, but I want $200 per door, 12% cash on cash return. Um, that that's, those are typically the, 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 my, my uh, North stars when, when looking at a property. Okay. And then what's, what's your process look like? I mean, you've got, your property manager is doing all the accounting. So I guess there's really very, very little management you have to do, if anything. But if there's anything you do have to do, what, what does that look like? And how many hours per day or week does that generally take for those that are maybe interested in doing something similar? Yeah. Um, the one thing I'll say is when I also look at cash flow, it's really important to bake in. Like for me, my numbers are outside of interest and insurance. I try and I set aside 10% for property management fees. I set aside um, 10% for monthly repairs. Um, So we may have something that pops up like a new AC unit or something or or hot water heater. So I set aside 10% a month and I also set 5% for vacancy in case there's, you know, a tenant turnover. Um, But in terms of my day to day, like I, I, I do not spend much, I don't have to spend much time on it. Um, A lot of it's reviewing um, like reviewing the statements, checking when leases are due. Um, I've been using typically five-year arms. Uh, some of them I have fixed 30 years, but also like what the market's doing. I'm really spending probably at most an, an hour a week. Um, but when I'm in deal hunting mode, that's where it can, it, it can certainly take up more time, but I enjoy that. So in 2020 now, how are you most, how are you finding most of your deals? Is it strictly through the wholesaler network and everything else you've set up? Are you doing a lot online too, or what does that look like? No, honestly, for me, and again, I don't have uh, like aggressive acquisition goals and I, I, I know it'll shift to that, but a lot of times it's, it's meeting friends. It's talking to my property manager, interviewing other property managers, and then friends of friends. Um, also like, I go on Craigslist and I get on buyers list for people who are renting and flipping a particular area. So this getting on buyers list and just trying to establish what you want to do is for me is establishing good relationships with, with wholesalers. That way it's not like they just throw a deal up and it's a free for all trying to put yourself in a position where you're getting their first call. Cause you know, you're going to do what you say you're going to do. All right. That makes sense. And by the way, everybody, if, if anyone has any questions, if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen and put it in the chat, then we can run it by Jason in case anything comes up that you have questions on, uh, maybe that we're missing. Um, then yeah, we'll, we'll read those off and see if Jason can answer them. Um, 
in the meantime, did you want to talk about your syndication a little bit? How did how you got in that, um, and and what that whole process looked like for you? Yeah, um, it was actually a fun one, and took me down a rabbit hole of meeting a lot of syndicators there um, in 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 Austin. Um, for me, I know everybody has a pretty like polar stance. Like, I'm I, I'm fully invested in the stock market. I haven't invested in real estate. I'm really nervous about it. Or you know what? like self-directed 401, uh, self-directed IRA, pull your money out of every investment and put it in real estate. I think I'm a pretty even keel and I like diversity. So like one of the things I was looking at is, all right, if I'm not able to, because I have this time limit, if I'm not able to find deals as often as I want to, and I don't want to put all my money in the market, um, what's a good middle ground where I can still uh, invest my money in a syndic- uh, in real estate, but passively? And the beauty about a syndication is basically you have um, an operator or a syndicator who pulls together funds and they invest them in a certain type of asset. There's syndicators in, in everything. You have syndicators who invest in like angel invest in startups or venture capital companies. You have syndicators who do mobile home parks, which Chase, I know you get into. For me, I, and their syndicators are commercial. For me, I was like, you know what? I know residential well. That's where I, my, my passion has been. I'm going to find somebody who invests in B, like B, A minus, anywhere between like B minus to A minus properties um, and that invest in multifamily real estate. I personally like that. So I, first off, I set a criteria of what I wanted to invest in. I like that because if you go with an A plus property, market tanks, people are probably spending above their means in a really nice place with granite countertops and and marble everywhere. They're going to be like, Oh man, I lost my job or times are tough. They're going to go back, um, into, uh, they're going to move down to it like a lower, a property that's more in their price range. They're more recession, uh, uh, recession resistant, I should say. And I try and I go for value adds. So somebody you can take on and have, you know, improved net operating income, lower costs, et cetera. So I made uh, a cri- that, that was my criteria. Okay. And then I, uh, I had a, a good friend of mine is actually a guy who reported into me before his friends were actually um, a guy that he knew um, was running a syndication. So I actually had lunch with him. One thing, everybody knows how hard it is for somebody to get time with who they want to be a mentor, et cetera. Owners and operators of syndication, they can't publicly go out and market what they do. I believe it's against the SEC uh, regulations they have in place. So right. they have a vested interest to want to spend time with you. So they want to make sure that you're of sane mind. Some of them require you to be an accredited investor. Some don't, but they actually need to establish a relationship with you before you invest. So they're actually very, very good with their time. And if you meet one, they're going to mention other people too. Like you sh- you can go out there and look for, for syndicators. The beauty about it is, is um, limited partner. So my money is only tied to my investment. If the property is sued, et cetera, that's not on me as a limited partner. That has to deal with the actual operators. Returns uh, are typically very good, especially if you work with a world-class operator where you're looking typically between eight to 9% uh, annual return. And the real big payday is when they go and sell. You have to be willing to lock your money up for three to five years. But I believe in my, the property I'm invested even with COVID's on track, but the pay, the return is a 1.9 X return. So almost doubling your initial investment. That's so you amazing. put in 25 K you, you're going to get your eight or 9% a year, but then the real big payday on top of that is when they sell, you get uh, your portion of what it sold for and your initial investment back. And they haven't sold you. You still are in it, right? I'm still in it. Yeah. Right now. I just got my quarterly disbursement yesterday for it, by the way. How much, um, how much longer are you supposed to be in that one? Um, they typically say three to five years. We're coming up on three years. Um, obviously COVID happened. I would say within the next two years, it'll probably be sold. Um, that's the one in San, San Antonio, Texas is 194 unit apartment complex. Okay. Gotcha. Um, we have one, question in the chat i think it's yeah. all of us really um the the joel is looking to get into wholesaling he doesn't know much about real estate 
and wants to understand the whole concept, um, what would you all recommend I do to properly educate myself in this field? And at what point should he create an LLC? Also, he's trying to do this with a full-time job Monday through Friday. So since we're on the topic of full-time jobs, um, I don't know if you're familiar with wholesaling, Jason, but yeah, yeah. I mean, nice dude, that. yeah. And I thought about going this route too. Um, I, I, number one is like, I can't say it enough, like go to bigger pockets and, and look up wholesaling and there's going to be ridiculous amounts of articles on it. So number one is get the concept down. Wh that way, you know, exactly what you're, um, what, what you're, what you're going to be doing um, um, in, in the ins and outs of it. So number one is understanding what you're getting yourself into. Number two is establish the market where you want to wholesale, where, um, yeah, see, uh, Joel's oh, yeah, in here as well. I'll Joel in to talk. Hey, Joel, how you doing? Hey, how's it going? Hey, man. Um, so Thank Joel, what I, what I was saying is, uh, like, dude, so many resources out there, like bigger pockets, we can just learn a ton about what it means to wholesale. Um, right. the number one thing for wholesale is once you understand it is choosing a market you want to operate in. I would keep it very like down to even do, do a city level. Um, it, um, and then, uh, do you mind me asking where you're located, Joel? I'm in Harrisonburg. Okay, great. Yeah. So take, take Harrisonburg as in a, a, as a market. Like, again, I know it well. Um, so Joel, what I would do is once you understand it, you need, the next thing you need to do is figure out deal flow. So what you can do, like the beauty of whole, wholesaling is you're approaching people who own properties and you say, hey, I like your property. I'd like to consider purchasing it um, uh, like as is. Uh, are you open to a conversation? One way you can find this, and I did this in Harrisonburg and Matthias, you could probably speak uh, a lot to this. You can go to the Harrisonburg, like the city of Harrisonburg directory. You can actually get public files of everybody who owns a property in Harrisonburg, but their bill to or their mailing address is not in Harrisonburg. So you know every one of those people own a property in Harrisonburg, but they don't live there. Um, so out of state, like you can approach them like, hey, I see you own this property. What are you doing with it? Do you want out of it? Is there a way I'd be able to maybe take that off your hands? Um, and Matthias and, and Chase, I'd love for you guys to chime in uh, uh, just this far. That's, yeah, that's pretty, go ahead. You're first, Matthias. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say that the um, uh, you can check out the GIS. I know Rockingham County will very easily uh, export uh, all the data. So you could go, you could draw a custom line around a neighborhood if you wanted to target one, for example, and then do a custom export. Um, and then you'll get all the all the property owners and names, the addresses. Um, so there's like the 911 address, and there's also the the uh, the mailing address. And so you can, okay. you can see if those two match. If they don't match, then that means that they're not living in the house. Um, and so you can sort and find those properties very easily that way. I'm not 100% sure if the Harrisonburg GIS does it the same way. Harrisonburg did it for me. I haven't done it recently, but Harrison, I actually talked to somebody at the city of treasury or the treasury department there and they pulled it. Um, what is so the like, GIS? Sorry. What is the GIS? GIS is like a, um, the GIS is like a, where you can get zoning information and all sorts of, it's like a map. Imagine like kind of like Google maps, but it's got a bunch of different overlays where you can see, uh flood zones you can see um zoning you can see you okay. get all the it's all the tax information so you can get everybody's name like if you want to know whose house is live, who who owns that house right there you can find that out it might be an llc you can, you, you can even find out how much they paid for it and when they bought it that's all yeah. public record so okay. joel another thing is you can also get it's it's, it's access to data you just get a you go get, and there's like i think listsource.com is another way you can find you can actually go in there and pay for them to build you a list but what you can do joel is show me every property that was purchased more than 10 years ago and if you start to isolate some of those properties you can see what they paid for it and you can go into zillow and see how much it's worth now because okay. you don't want to you don't want to go to a person who bought the property a year or two ago because they don't have enough equity to sell it to you like what you want to ideally find is find somebody who's had the same property for 20 years connect to them like hey you know what i've been thinking about moving i've been thinking about this i bought it for 100 it's now worth you know it, it's now worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars fully fixed up but honestly man it needs so much work 
I, I'd be happy to sell it for 180. So you get the contract for $180,000. You can go and find somebody who's willing to buy it for $220,000. And that spread is your profit on it. You're right. doing them the service of getting all the work off their plate and finding them a buyer who would buy it as is or whatever. And you're right. just the one making the deal happen. Yes. Okay. But I guess um, what we could do too is we could have a con longer conversation at the very end about wholesaling. So um, that way we can kind of stay on track for the topic and then later come back and answer all the questions you have. But um, I guess before we do that, what is like the main thing or like the main question that you're having issues with that we can maybe help with right now? Uh, I, I just want to get started and I'm anxious to start. And right now I'm limited to, I'm working, I actually work Monday through Thursday and I get out of work at six. And so I have all weekend to dedicate to this, some evenings and then all weekend to dedicate to this. And mm -hmm. I would like have you to, listen to the, be as a, what was that? I'm sorry for interrupting. I was just wondering, have you listened to the Bigger Pockets podcast at all? I've been on their website, but I haven't heard their, I haven't. I, I would start I, I with some questions and got to their website that way. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm going to look them up. That would, that would be, I think, a, helpful in a couple different ways. It'll give you information, but also I think they're really good at giving you motivation. Like you hear success stories all the time and yeah. uh, people who have done it. And I think, I mean, I think that would be my first recommendation. The, the yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, thinking about that. So like once you understand it and you understand the concept, they also go through tips and tricks and way you can, ways you can do it. The next thing is, is plan a, a plan uh, out a cadence for, for getting in touch with these buyers. A very easy way is to get a list of the buyers you want to target. I'd probably target like 100 or so um, houses that you're interested in buying. Most important thing, Joel, is you just don't reach out to them once. You want to actually set up a cadence of reaching out to them. Like if you're going to mail them, set a plan over the next um, you know, six months, once a month or once every three weeks, I'm going to send them uh, a letter. It can be a type letter. You actually, you can get really creative and, and actually get yellow paper that looks like a post-it note almost and get handwritten font. So even though you're doing it at scale, it looks like it's handwritten font going in and say, I'm very interested. Like Joe, if you go looking, you'll find templates to do that as well. The most important thing is don't just try it once. But like, man, it doesn't work. I quit. Um, it's a consistent effort, man. And it's not easy, but if you can develop a system for doing that, and it does cost money to mail these letters. Um, if you do it consistently, you'll, you, you can be in a, uh, you can see success. And all it does is take one deal to easily, um, you know, wipe out uh, whatever the cost was to actually get it going. Right. Um, awesome. And then just awesome. one more, one more tip. We had a wholesaler a couple week, a couple months ago on um, that we can we can link you the the video. It would still be up here, so you can you can kind of hear um, what he did and everything in Charlottesville. So that that could awesome. be really helpful for you as well. Awesome, thank you. I won't be able to stay until eight o'clock. I believe is what the yeah. Um, I won't be. I'll have to log off around seven ish. But. Go. Um, okay. Go. Yeah, man, go on to our uh, Facebook page and check out the previous events, and there should be all the videos of the past people. So, um, what's the Facebook page called? Uh, it's Harrisonburg Real Estate Investors. I'll um, I can link it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, I mean, did anybody else have any more questions for Jason? If if not, we could just uh, talk about more about that kind of throw together a plan for Joel and and talk about some other resources and stuff that could help with that with wholesaling. But um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I'm happy to take this in any direction. I think the most important thing is like, regardless, uh, like there are a million and one ways to make money in real estate. Like you need to, like what you need to be real with yourself is what are my goals? Am I trying to make money in large spurts? And, uh, um, like I would make a list of what are your goals? And then you then start to map those goals to ways you can attain those goals. So if your goal is, hey, man, I'm trying to get out of my full-time job as soon as possible, or I just don't want to be relying on my full-time job to, 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 for income, like my goal, you'll find yourself in being in the wholesaling route or the flipping route. For me, I actually do love what I do. And eventually, obviously, I don't want to be working until I'm 65 doing this. So my, my goal is let me make some strategic uh, medium to long-term investments through buy and hold strategies and and you know, build up a cash pool where I can either pay them down and increase my cash flow, or whatever. 
number one is just to make a, make a plan if you haven't invested yet. And, and then important to take stock uh, on a regular basis. How am I doing against those goals? Um, that's just been, and that's the way I've done it again. Like I know I could work, you know, 20 hours a day if I wanted to strategically, like I want to dedicate my time to my family. Um, but also that requires me like spending, you know, X amount of hours with you guys doing, I actually enjoy this, but I think it's important to just actually, you know, set a plan and baby steps to how you want to get there. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. And I think, I think the big thing too, with um, any of those goals, re remote investing, or, you know, going back to the wholesaling is, especially if you're trying to find a deal, you're going to have to set, you're either gonna have to spend a set amount of time looking for one. So you're doing a lot of time. You've got your, you've spent your time networking with other um, wholesalers and real estate investors in your market. But uh, for Joel, for example, if he's looking to get started in wholesaling, um, he's going to have to weigh, well, do I have the time to go around and try to find abandoned houses and then call on owners, which is the cheaper route to do, but just takes again more time. Or do I have the budget put together to do a mail out? And then like you were saying, you got to be consistent with it, do it monthly or um, whatever your goal is, kind of work backwards from that and then make sure you have the budget to do it for at least six months. So um, that's the thing is you want, you want to get six to seven mail outs for sure. And that's generally about the time you're going to get your first deal. Some people get lucky getting the first one or two, but generally it's between four to, to six before you get your deal, assuming you're mailing to at least 200 people. I, I think another thing too, is you mentioned, uh, Matthias said, if you are, uh... Like if you see, like if you go and see the properties that that I own, you won't see my name. You'll see my LLC and my company name. It's also worth it to connect with the people who who own that LLC. So if I go and I like I in in for instance in in Charlottesville, I found there there's one particular LLC that you can see the properties that they own. They had like a massive portfolio. So one of the things I did is I contacted the, the owner of, the, uh, of that company. I'm like, hey, you obviously been doing this for a long time. Um, you can go a lot of different routes. One, love to get to know you and um, like always provide value. Hey, I'd love to take you out to lunch. You know, I'll pay for it, whatever. Um, just uh, try and add value instead of take, take, take. But the other thing too is like, hey, by the way, are there any of these properties you don't want? Um, some people are, are getting older and, and they, or they just like, there's like, you know what, it's time for me to sell off what I've owned for 20 or 30 years. Some people honestly hate doing, uh, being a landlord. So they're like, you know what, man, I'm done with this. Like, I'm happy to do this. And they understand that, you know, you as an investor, maybe you're not going to pay full price, but like, that's actually something that's been very helpful um, for me to, and honestly, just meet people and to start seeing where that goes and meeting people. Um, uh, which has been a pretty cool route for me to go as well. Yeah. The connections are huge. And I think too, especially going back to the wholesaling route, you've got a really good group right here. People that will buy your deals, just finding them right now. So if you can, if you can put in the work and, or the money for the marketing to get a good deal, then you're going to be able to easily find somebody to buy it from you as long as you actually have a good deal. So yeah, Joel, you got three emails right now to add to your list of when you find that deal. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, 100%. Um, I'll also put in here um, to, uh, I think Devin had a question, who was my syndication with? Um, um, do you, I can type my answer. If you, I can give you guys their website. Um, I just sent it out. It's a company called Wildhorn Capital. Um uh, I, I just sent it over to you. Wildhorn partners with, with another company. Um, uh, Andrew Campbell and Reed Go uh, Goosens are the two gentlemen that I know and that I've personally met and, and I'm in, I'm investing in one of their deals right now. Um, so that, that's it. That's the company that I chose to go with, with my first syndication and honestly probably do another one with them too. The other thing too is, Look, there's a barrier to entry. Like uh, most of the times, uh, it'll be a 25k to a 50k minimum uh, investment for them. Um, if you don't have that kind of money, another thing too is there are companies like um, Fundrise. Fundrise, yeah, Fundrise and 
uh, and companies like that, where you essentially can go on, on it's kind of like, like um, it's a marketplace. It's like you shop on Amazon, you can shop for deals. Um, there are pluses and minuses to doing that, but like I've been talking about doing fundrise. I think one of the downsides is, is they sort of like give you what your, what your estimated monthly returns are gonna be, but you don't really get to participate in the actual sale outside of getting your initial investment back. A lot of times they're not sharing as much uh, on the back end, but that's essentially like, instead of investing in the stock market, you can invest in these deals. Well, that was, that was one question I was gonna bring up um, before we, got, we started going on the wholesaling route was, what was your process like when you were going through the limited partnership buying that deal? So when you were, the Wild Horn was going through due diligence and all that stuff in the process of purchasing the apartment complex to turn around, did you have to do anything? Did they share reports with you? What was the communication like that whole process? Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So what they'll do first off, get on there. Um, I'm actually going to see if I can find one to, uh, um, to, to show you guys here. Um, what they'll do is you can get up, you can get a part of their, their, like their investor list. And what they'll do is they'll make, they'll, they'll make a call, so to speak, where they send it out like, Hey guys, we're about to open up for this investment. Here are the details high level. If you're interested in, they actually run a live webinar, webinar Q and A, and they run through the entire deal structure. They actually have to release a lot of this uh, due to the sec regulations, but they actually, and then if you want to schedule one off time on top of that, um, you, you can do that. Um, um, I'm trying to see if I can find an example of this. Um, I'll see if I can find one, but essentially they say they're opening up. Um, actually, I'll, if I can share my screen, I can probably show an example of this. You should be able to. Yep. Give yeah. me a sec. Uh, dismiss. So Jason, I'm entering in my third decade. I noticed that different in the future, Wellings Capital spent the last few years as the number third, we will have the following investments in the portfolio. Uh, 21 mobile home parks and self-storage facilities with an operator has generated internal rate of return of 60% for a number of years. Two mobile home parks are one of America's top, uh, top operators. Um, 51 self-storage facilities with a 5 million, uh, 5 million investment. Um, and then it says click to join the webinar. So if you, it's like, hey, after much due diligence, we're pleased to announce the income fund two is moving forward with investing. And then you can click here and actually sign up for the webinar. So you can read the high level terms of it. And then if you're interested, you actually just fill out the requirements here and click register. And then you're not committing to anything that is sort of open season it for you to learn about it. And then there'll be a number of limited spots. And if you want to invest, you simply follow the process and invest. Have we had have we had Paul Moore speak before, Mateus? I can't remember. Not with me. You might have before. <laughs> okay, we should have him come back on. He's he's a really good guy. Really, really good guy. He actually it lives in the thick in Virginia now. Um, yep. But he got his start um, uh, selling uh, Smith Mountain Lake uh, properties. Did then, um, sorry, sorry to cut you off. Did he um, uh, so he was working with Wildhorn then. That's is that how. You did it or un, un, unrelated actually oh, okay, un, got un, unrelated um i just followed a number of like investor podcasts and he was on one of them and same thing like if i wanted to talk to uh talk to him most of the time on their site it's a scheduled time to talk with us because they need to talk to you and understand who you are yeah um i'll see if i can find his website um Yeah, so a prime example with, 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 with this. So like Wellings Capital, literally you can just click schedule a call and then you can actually literally pick a time to speak directly with, with, with Paul or a member of his team. I love Calendly. Yeah. Dude, it's, it's incredible. It's like how I run my life. Um, <laughs> but that's it. So like if you're, it, again, this requires typical more capital, but they have to like they have to get get to know you a bit so actually putting yourself having a conversation with them they want to know about you you can ask them about their investor style etc um you can certainly schedule time and speak directly with the operators
Um, one of the things I would just want to talk about briefly that since the, you know, the whole topic of this is kind of investing with a full-time job. And I, th I think that for the most part, people are probably going to be doing the like buying a house to live in and then moving, moving on. And I think that's a really, really good strategy. I mean, you can talk about house hacking, you can talk about just buying a, a simple townhouse or a, a primary residency. I know that's not the, you, you took that route once, Jason, but I think, I think for a lot of people, that's probably a really, really good option. Dude, especially if you get like, I mean, sorry, but just seem to interrupt. Um, no, go ahead. But if you think about it this way, if you can buy a duplex, triplex or quadplex and you live in one side and rent out the other, you're essentially going to live very worst case scenario, reduced mortgage, likely scenario, rent free or mortgage free because the, the other three or one unit's going to pay your more or best case you make money on it like i had a buddy who bought a house in charlottesville and then he has a separate like outhouse and it's like maybe 400 square feet the lady the tenant that's in there has lived there for probably now like seven years now and essentially just he was able to pay off that in his entire house kind of an extreme scenario because he drove a lot of his personal money in, but I believe he paid it off in like five or seven years. Wow. So imagine that you buy a duplex um, and all of a sudden you have somebody else paying your mortgage. You can be saving that money to make the next purchase. Then you go live in that house and then you rent out the second unit of that duplex at, at the same time. That's house hacking at its finest. Yeah. Um, and is it like your dream home? No, uh, not, not necessarily, but like, like you can't have a cake and eat it too. You can't have your cake and in, in your dream house at 30 years old um, when you don't have the money for you. Like that's just a way to realistically build up wealth and equity. Like I love that approach. And it, it's, I think it's awesome. Cause I mean, a lot of the things that we're talking about here, like um, could, could be later on, like if you're doing a syndication later on um, you might have gotten there by buying a property living in it for a little bit, renting it out, moving into another one, building that up. And then you can get equity lines on these properties. Cause like the one that you bought six years ago might have gone up $50,000 in value, you know, over That's, that time. And then if you yeah. have, if you get an equity line in any of them um, at any point, you know, you could probably use that money and make still a return, even though you're paying interest on that money, you could make a return given their That's, higher interest rates. I did that with, so what I did, it is important to start a relationship with the bank. So when I started the relationship with the bank and I had one property under them, I asked them if I could get a, a, a line of credit. Um, so they gave me an unsecured line of credit. Um, let's just call it 50 grand. Um, when I was purchasing this property, if I wanted to purchase price of 95 K 20, let's call it hundred K for even numbers purchase price is going to, um, I have to put 20% down. That's $20,000. I have $12,000 in repairs. That's $32,000. Um, what I could do in that case and what I, uh, what I, what I could do in that case is <laughs> use my entire line of credit and I'm paying interest only on it. I know I'm paying a premium on it, but in six months, I'm actually going to refinance and pull all my money out. Um, can we play Hillcline? Yeah, but you can play Hillcline here. Let me give this to you. Um, yeah, so like I actually used my line of credit on that on that property, um, wh which was you play mine. Yeah, I'll play yours and you play mine. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was really good to I, I use like again you're paying interest only on, on the money, so you're I was probably paying like an extra three hundred dollars a month for for using that line of credit. But now I'm out of pocket, no money. Right. Um, it's also important to have a full time job at the same time. That's pretty lousy because that allows you to be financeable basically yeah. by a bank because you actually have w2 consistent income etc so having a full-time job i know people don't necessarily like it or want it but it's also the air in your quiver to get financing to help you achieve what you want to achieve so that's yeah that's something to think about too i think if you're younger one of the, a great way to get started too is like you said you can do a duplex or even just a, a townhouse let's say you get a three-bedroom and you're, you're younger, you have some friends, you could rent out the other rooms, you gotta make sure, you know, the restrictions for the neighborhood allow that and everything. But they could basically be paying your mortgage. Um, but 
what Jason was saying there at the end is really important. You've got to be able to have a good job. So if you're looking to do something where you're wholesaling or having self-employed income, then the bank's going to want to make sure that you have that stability and it's reoccurring income. It's going to be a little bit harder to get financing. So um, having a W-2 job will help that out a lot. And, you know, you can have a very low down payment, three and a half percent and get into something and have your uh, mortgage basically paid for by other people. Dude, I that's the other thing is there's this stigma um, that you have to put 20% down or 25% down to own the house you live in. And that's not true. Um, um, I mean, you guys loan, um, you know, sell people houses that are using an FHA loan or another one where they may have to pay PMI or mortgage insurance, but they're only putting down five, 10, 15%. So if you're able to do that, yeah, you're out of that money because it's tied up in that property unless you refinance it at some point. But you can do with a minimum investment purchase of property in a duplex. And also you're able to write off a lot of it too, because it now becomes your office because you're, you're, you're running a real estate business uh, leasing to people who live next door to you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's one of the best actionable items that somebody could do to, that wants to start, you know, working with a full time. And, and if like, it gets harder when you have a family and stuff like to, to buy a property that would be a good rental. But I mean, I think if, if you're really committed to that um, you know, it, there's, there's great small single family houses or great, you know, townhouses that you don't have to put a ton of money into, or it's not a huge mortgage basically. Cause you want to be able to make a little money when it rents um, and just, yeah, just moving around. And I think it's, I, I wish I would have done more of that. I've done it once and it was, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It worked really Dude, well. I, I know hindsight's 2020, but like, I remember living in Austin. I was like, I, we're only going to be here, you know, one to three years. doesn't make sense to buy. I mean, uh, I wish I would have, and I wish I would have bought a duplex and lived in one side. Um, Cause now the property prices have like gone up 50% since I, I lived there. You know what? At least I um, like, I don't mind renting. I, I think people who COVID's changed that because you're really, most people are, you know, working remotely now, but it, there is beauty in being able to go up and move wherever you want to. Renting uh, allows you to do that. But dude, that, if I had to go back and do it again, I would absolutely buy a, a duplex or something. And I lived in one side. It's the easiest way to unlock, uh, unlock equity and, and just make money and reduce your expenses. Well, um, that's, yeah, it's quite a bit. And I, thank you for all the, you know, just telling us how you did everything, Jason, and your processes, because a lot of that was, especially the remote investing and stuff, I think a lot of people will find a lot of value in that. Um, but I think we could go ahead and open it up in case other people that are here had any questions or want to talk about other things. Maybe, maybe just want to ask Jason what his favorite movie is. Um, but <laughs> we could open it up or go talk more about the wholesaling. Um, any questions, just put it in the chat and we can unmute you and go from there. Yeah, I, uh, as we see if, if any questions come in, I think yeah. the thing about remote investing is like, let's say you are local, like I'm not a handyman. I've learned a lot, especially being a homeowner and like, um, uh, but end of the day, if something goes wrong in your house, you are a house that you own. What really helped me is like, all right, well, something goes, goes wrong in a house and I happen to be local. Maybe I can go there and comfort them. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to have to call somebody that I probably don't know to go in and fix something. What's the difference of doing that in another city? Like it's, it's the same thing, right? Unless you're a handy person. You're like, I don't want to pay a property manager. Living closely allows me to go do the repairs. If you're using a property management company, um, they're probably going to know people who they're, you're paying them to find a solution to that problem. It doesn't matter. Then the only thing becomes is how well I don't know the market to want to buy a property there. That's the, really the only difference. Well, I think the big thing too, that really helps with the way you're doing it is it's not just they're managing the contractors. It's, you know, when you're entering a new market, especially now it's, it's hard to find good contractors. So there's a lot of ways of doing that, but you're saving yourself the brain damage of having to find good contractors because if they're a good property management company that does a lot of business, they're going to have contractors that are going to give them the best price to get the work done. So therefore- Yeah, you it's economies of scale, right? They're like, dude, you have to really take care of our, our, our tenants 
uh, I'm sorry, our our properties because we we have another hundred that we deal with and we can make sure we call you. Yeah. And a good property manager, and they're certainly not all good ones, but a good property manager has a vested interest to keep the call slower or else they're going to have to take an angry phone call from an investor like me. Like, man, why did that cost you four grand to fix? Yeah. Um, do you so. cap? Do you cap your repairs? Do you have a certain amount that you want to be called for if it costs above five hundred bucks or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, for me, it's roughly anything under a grand if it needs. First off, it's the first question for me is this is more of a moral code is like how damaging it is. Like, is this an inconvenience or is it a legit problem? Like sure. a, a dripping sink. Like it's, it doesn't really affect the quality of life. It can be annoying. That becomes more my problem if it becomes more damage. But like if something like a, a refrigerator goes out, like that's something that needs to be addressed because people need to be able to eat. Yeah. So I, I, my, my stance is what's the severity of the situation? Is this, if it's something that's not dire, if it's dire, handle it. Like I trust my, 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 my team to do that. But if it's something that's more of like a, Hey, the washing machine works. They just want a better one. I I I make sure they call and talk to me first because there's ways to work that out. Which is sure. like, hey, we split the cost of it, right? Um, but it, it really comes to, to the severity of the situation. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, also, I just try and set reserves. Like, if you buck, like, like a case in point is we had the tenant needed uh, a new a stove. Um, I've been, even though we had no repairs in the last four months, I've been saving up 10% of the rent that's $1,200. So I do that and that's $120, four months, that's now $500, $480. Like that covers the stove that needs to get done. Just prepare for it. What you don't want to do is pull out all that money. And when something happens and ine inevitably something will happen, have that on hand. So I don't consider that part of cash flow that just goes into the, in the fund there as well. Yeah. So, um, looks like I do have to wrap this up. It's getting closer to bedtime, but were there any questions? Um, um, none that have popped up so far. Let me check our Facebook page just in case. No, nothing, nothing so far. I mean, we, you've answered quite a bit of questions as Mateus and I have gone through, we've been peppering you with them too. So. Yeah, I know. I know people have emailed me too, saying that they've been they're really interested in the topic and they just couldn't make it now, and we'll be looking at it later. So, yeah, I mean, I'm always uh, happy happy to talk, and and you know, um, anytime. I'm, I, if you guys have me, obviously, I'd love to participate and help out however I can. Um, can you send your cal Calendly link to. <laughs> yeah, right to, to the world. Maybe when I start running a syndication, and you, I have to meet to meet everybody. Um, but. Uh, now, guys, I love what you're doing. Uh, I, I love just learning from people in sense of community and just providing value first, which it, which is awesome. So thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to come out and speak with us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, thank you all so much. Um, I, uh, Joel, I actually will tackle one last one. Um, when should I create an LLC? Um, I guess we can end on this one. I think that's a good topic. My personal thing is an LLC costs essentially a hundred bucks to set up. Um, and uh, I took the route of doing it ahead of time. It's, it's, it's also more deeper than just creating an LLC. You have to have like an operating agreement. It takes realistically a couple hundred dollars and uh, uh, maybe an hour of your time to do it properly. And you can run things through that that also protects your assets. Obviously I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, so I'm not the right topic for that. Maybe a good segue for the gentleman I was saying you guys should have on, but you don't need one. You can run it under your own name um, as an example too, but love to get your guys' thoughts. And maybe that can be one I sign out on and leave you guys to answer. All right. That sounds good. Well, thank you, Jason. Yeah, we'll talk about that some more. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks guys. And Joel, thanks for coming on night. too, man. All right, bye guys. Bye. Right. Joel, I, I mean, Joel, I think that you, I, my advice to you would be to get into uh, uh, just really learning the the whole world of real estate investing. I think that it's it's quite the uh, rabbit hole, um, and 
I don't know if the first step is getting an LLC. I think oftentimes people will jump to that or that's one of the things they want to do because they want to put all the properties into it. We've, I've, I've heard people say that they, they have like LLC under LLC under LLC under LLC and they have this huge uh, whole thing, but then I don't know if they actually had any properties. Um, so my, my, my suggestion would be really to, to and let me just get you on here, man. Um, but um, my suggestion would be to really just jump into learning this whole world. And I think that like bigger pockets, this kind of stuff is really good. Um, and, uh, you know, through that process, you'll probably, you're probably gonna wanna get a ton of knowledge before you take action on something other than maybe buying a primary residency, right? Um, right. So I think, I think that getting that knowledge base, um, that will become more apparent. Um, I mean, as, as, it, as it refers to wholesaling, I don't know, maybe you wanna talk about that, Chase? Yeah, um, I think pretty much like Matea said, I think what if it were me, what I would do is, and I were in your position, I would take a month and just spend time uh, trying to absorb as much information. But after that month, just start taking action because what will happen is you'll, you'll get in this phase of just trying to basically postpone act, taking action by learning. You think you're getting somewhere, but you're not. So after a month, if you are steadily spending time doing that, you'll have enough education in order to know what you're doing. And you're welcome to post any questions, you know, on our Facebook group because we know the answers. It can point you the right direction. We'll be happy to do so. Um, but about the LLC, it, it's like I'm, I'm like Mateus is saying. I think you need to focus on getting getting the education and your first steps in the right direction before you really worry about any of that stuff. I mean, um, I'm not an attorney, not a lawyer. I'm not suggesting you don't get one or anything like that. I'm just saying if your plan is wholesaling, I've known people that have rental properties of portfolios of 10 or more properties just now are getting into getting LLCs. So I think um, you need to do what you're comfortable with risk wise, but um, you kind of have to weigh that risk if it makes sense for you to get one now um, just before you get started, or, um, you know, you could still always try to do a deal or two first and then get the LLC. Yeah. Okay. The reason I'm, the reason I'm asking is this because I, I want to make sure I do all all of this in a, in a legal fashion. You know, I don't want to, I also want to protect myself and my assets and I don't want to get in trouble and, and I'm getting married soon. So, you know, I don't want to get my, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I don't want to get my, my fiance in trouble as well. <laughs> I don't want to put us in a hole before we even get married. <laughs> well, I would say just, I mean, again, spend your time getting the education. And um, I would, again, I would, I would take the action steps first, the marketing, everything like that, because, LLCs don't take long to set up and they're not expensive. So once you're in the process of taking those action steps, getting calls, st talking to sellers, you know, yeah. then you have your LLC set up. And so sorry to interrupt you. When I market, what do I market as just an investor? I mean, yeah, if you're looking, are you looking to wholesale? Are you, are you thinking about doing the buy and hold thing or uh, both? You know, I mean, I think, I think your best thing to do would again, just, you know, have it as your name. Um, mm -hmm. and just say, look, you're a local investor or whatever you want. Um, but I definitely don't think you should be advertising as a business. It makes you more personable if you're just advertising as yourself. But when you go to sign the contract, mm -hmm. if you're going to be wholesaling or, you know, to actually buy, then, um, then you can do it in your LLC and just explain to them, look, it's me, but this is just my company and it has to be for legal reasons, blah, blah, blah. The other thing to think about is, if you're planning on having an LLC that's going to hold properties, uh, this is getting a little more complicated, um, and one that's going to be wholesaling or flipping, then you're going to have those be two separate LLCs. What was that? What was that? I, I do have to have them separate or no? Well, I, I think, um, again, I'm not an attorney, not a lawyer, um, but something to consider is the amount of volume you're doing in an LLC, because all they're there is to provide uh, a blanket right for liability risk. So right. if you're doing a lot of transactions, you're going to want to have that separate from one that just has, you know, rental properties. Mm, okay. After they get to a certain amount of rental properties, they'll have additional LLCs. Okay. So I can literally do this all in my name for a while without having to convert into an LLC. Um, it's, it's no. pretty much no. What's that? Or, or no. What? It's, it's pretty much up to your risk tolerance. I mean, I, I would advise, I would advise getting one, but I'm just saying it's better to take action first towards getting deals. There's no point right. in getting an LLC and then never even doing any marketing or setting up a plan or getting that stuff done. That okay. LLC can be set up 
um, in the process of all of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's I guess first step. All right, I got you. I got you. Yeah, think about it like all this: right. if you're if you're doing wholesaling, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the contracts, but in a lot of those are going to say, let's say, uh, Joel. Um, and or assign, so your full name and or assign. So you could be assigning it to an LLC you haven't formed yet, as an example. So that's very common in like commercial transactions. You'll have it, um, you could have it even in your personal name and you have to assign it to an LLC because you haven't created that LLC yet because you haven't finished your due diligence to know if you're actually gonna close it, if that all makes sense. So I guess what I'm saying is just focus on the next step and your next step should be education and then taking action to get deals, so. And Joel, where are you coming from? What have you What have you read? Where have you heard of wholesaling? What What's your? Uh, I don't even remember how I got come across this. Uh, I think I heard of Clever Investors a really long time ago, and I subscribed to their emails. And actually, honestly, I ignore them, but I've been reading, <laughs> trying to read them lately. Sure. I mean, something in the, in the last couple of weeks, something just you know triggered me, and I'm like. I need, I need to get back into looking into real estate. Is that um, and Cody with Clever Investor, is that who that is? Yeah, Cody. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Nope, I don't. Just bigger pockets. He's bigger gonna, pockets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, that's a, it's a really good resource. But Joel, have you read Have you read Rich Dad Poor Dad? No. Can I Can I get that for you? Sure. Sure. Rich Dad. Yeah. Uh, that I think that would be. Uh, I think it's 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 not necessarily like a, a textbook that's you know going to have all answers or anything like that. But I think it's a really good kind of thing that kind of gets a lot of people going, and it, it, it provides some motivation and, and that kind of stuff. So I, I think it's a good 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 starting point. I think that the um, you know the the bigger pockets is really is really big too. I mean, obviously we've been talking about that all the time. I personally am a podcast person, so I I would listen to their podcast a lot. I didn't get deep into their forums, but they have both, and they're they're both great. So, I, yeah, that's that's all I, I only saw the forums. I think somebody was asking a question that I asked, and that's why Google took me there or brought that up as a link. But um, what what else do they offer? What bigger pockets or yeah? Is what another way? Another question I do have is what would be the best route for me to educate myself on how to do this, and I and starting a business and all this, well, but the business will come later, but just, I'm, I don't feel like I know anything about any of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just want to get into it and do it the right way. Yeah. I mean, just spend that month, Google bigger pockets, wholesaling. There's, I put a link in the chat. There's a ultimate beginner's guide. We had a, a Kyle Miller who's doing about 70 deals this year was on a month or a couple months ago. So just watch his thing. And um, from there, you'll you'll have um, you know a solid foundation. Um, if you have time to listen to podcasts on the way to and from work, you can do the same thing. I just you just don't want to um, start thinking there's another answer out there and spending too much time on the education aspect of it. And then right. you'll, you'll still not feel like you know everything, but you just need to get started. And I think the thing that's important for wholesaling too is you know you need to be you need to be marketing to probably four to five hundred people minimum I need to be hitting them six or seven times that's i mean that's the real secret here and so to pull the list to, to do the mailers um you're gonna you're probably gonna be spending close to two grand so you need to make sure that you're okay with that spending that consistently over a six month period in order to get your first deal okay um, again if you're looking to do another route where you go out and you drive around and you look for distressed houses and call on owners and that's a much cheaper route but you're going to be spending a lot of your time and gas money in doing that too. So there's some hidden costs there. Right. Um, okay. Anything else you think, Mateus? No. Yeah. I think, I, th I think those are all good steps. I think getting into a regular podcast routine of, of bigger pockets that will give you a lot of direction because there's a lot of routes here. I mean, uh, wholesaling is great. Don't get me wrong, but there's other routes too. Like, I mean, if you, like we talked about house hacking, um, all that right. kind of stuff too. So like, I mean, you know, there's, there's possibilities of buying houses with no, if you're going to live in it, no money down, there's, you know, there's possibilities of that kind of thing. So like, it's, okay. there's different, there's just different ways. And I think, I think the world is of investing is so big <laughs> that it just, I think, yeah, I would just start, I would start that regularly. And I think what's great about bigger pockets is like, they do a really good job about pushing, like taking action. Like, I think I saw something about how to get your next two 
uh, investment properties, like, you know, like some kind of like committing to that kind of mentality. Um, yeah. they're all about the action and stuff, but yeah, check out the, check out the, um, we'll get you that, um, that book. And I think that would be a good starting point in, and then bigger pockets and, and, you know, committing to take some action, whether that's wholesaling or whatever, uh, whatever really speaks to you. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And reach out to us if you, you know, want to have any other questions or whatever. Sure. Thank you. And try not to get too, too drawn up in the weeds too. You're, you're asking about what to put on the, the mailer piece and everything like that. That's, I mean, that's all stuff you're going to be able to find on bigger pockets or online. I mean, there's YouTube, those videos will be able to help with everything. Some of the really specific nitty gritty stuff, I'm welcome to check with us and see if we can help. Um, but again, there are really good articles and stuff. And so I, if you really commit to that month and just have that education, you're saying, this is my, this is like my college for a month in real estate investing, then um, I think you'd be on the right path and then set some goals and take action. Great. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah. No problem at all. Thanks. Do you have any other questions before we head off for the evening? So we can let Devin. Devin, do you have anything you want to talk about? He's muted right now. No, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Yeah. I figured he'd have more syndication questions or, you know, when um, Jason was talking about that. Oh yeah. I had a lot, but I didn't have any questions for him. I could have helped him along with that uh, Wellings capital because I'm invested in that fund he was talking about. So the, the one he was showing uh, one of the big investors in that is Blackstone and mm -hmm. a guy named Sidney Coles, who Coles department stores. Mm -hmm. And that's how they're getting that fund started up because I think the minimum investment in that fund was like 50 million. And he's given up some of his shares to this fund. Wow. Because he wants, he's like 80 some years old and he wants to just start divesting of some of his stuff. And for, I guess, for estate purposes or whatever. And so his fund picked it up. Uh, Wellings Capital's fund picked it up. Oh, wow. And I think they got like three and a half million of it. So that's what they're raising. And the operator of that fund is phenomenal. So it's yeah. going to be cool. Some good people. Yeah. I think it'd be cool to have him on your uh, program. Yeah. Once he brought him up, I think uh, I'll try to reach out to Paul and see if maybe we can do something for next month. Because I know. Cool. Yeah. You can tell me he's got one one of the persons, uh, you know, in your group uh, invested in his fund. Number two, yeah. yeah, that's the that's the income fund, that same one that Jason had up there. Yeah, it's the okay. fund number two. Okay, yeah, I haven't, I haven't talked to Paul in about a year, but I I met with him in Lynchburg a little while ago, so I'll see if he can come up. There's lots. There's lots of, uh, you know, when people ask about how you get involved with syndications. It takes a while, but when you eventually you keep, keep uh, looking for them, eventually you, you find them. I mean, I'm I'm seeing like two syndication deals a month now on average. Yeah. You know, obviously I'm not doing them, but you know. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of money to do all but, of them. But I figure it's best to learn as much as you can about them. And yeah. actually you're not really, you are a little bit on what the syndication is, you know, what the property is and all that. But your main job would be is to try to find as much as you can about the operator, uh, the syndicator. Like the what Jason was saying, the uh, Wildhorn, he knew the person in, that was running that. So I doubt if he would have uh, invested in that if he didn't know him well. And yeah. know that he was a stand-up you know, person. And well, I think that's those, part of it. Yeah, are a lot of those syndications you're seeing coming through your email, are they all multifamily or a lot of those like self-storage and I think you're mentioning Coles and stuff like that. Are they kind of different? Well, the, uh, well, the Coles is, he was just giving up his portion of the funds in, the, yeah. in that group, which that uh, particular fund is invested in uh, mobile home parks and storage units. I think the fund right now has about 7,200 
uh, either lots or storage units. So that's a lot of, I think they got like 23 projects they're invested in. And, uh, and then uh, most of the other ones are multifamily. Like there's one from DeRosa. I don't know if you guys know Matt Faircloth, heard of him. Yeah, yeah, I don't see any of his stuff though. He just got a big uh, project down in North Carolina, Winston-Salem, it's like 336 units. They just purchased and that was, okay. that syndication just closed. That's a big deal. Yeah, but most of them are like what Jason was saying, they're, they're somewhere in the neighborhood of 200. Most of them are usually like 188, 200. Usually like what they're a bunch of 12 plexes or something. Yeah, I was just I was just curious too because especially a lot of the multifamilies with the way the interest rates have gone, cap rates have just compressed even more. So it's interesting you're still seeing a lot of a lot of deal flow because I feel like it make it be hard for the um, margins to work out. What they're doing is they just raise more money. They're also doing it's kind of interesting. They're starting to do more of a Class A and Class B type setups, whereas Class A investor would be just um, getting a return on their money. Mm -hmm. So like they might get, um, you know, 8% or 9% or 7%, depends on whatever they can get, you know, feel like they can give. And that's all they have. They're just gonna get their, it's almost like, you know, clipping a coupon. Yeah. Okay. Whereas class B is going might get a smaller preferred return, like maybe 7%. But they are uh, in on all the equity down the road. So if they reach that uh, 7% and they've still got money left over, then there's a split like 70-30 or 80-20 or something like that. So they might get additional money besides the 7%. It might go up as high as 12% or something like that, depending on how well things run and how well they can raise money. And, I mean, uh, rent money and that sort of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Makes sense. But the neat difference between what Jason was talking about, uh, the one down in North Carolina is like a C property. Mm -hmm. And he was investing in B plus A's. The difference between them is usually the A's are really nice places. Uh, and if they can raise income, say for every $50,000, the value of that property goes up a million bucks, you know, at a five cap. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you had that session one time about cap rates and how that's affected by raising income and that's, or cutting expenses, which still, you know, falls to the bottom line. Yeah. And uh, how's that, you know, relate to uh, an increase in what they could sell it for down the road. So there's the benefit of having a, a lower cap rate. But I think somewhere down the road, all those things are going to change. Uh, I think we still got a couple years left of low interest rates. After that, I don't have a good crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I started out, the interest rate, a good interest rate was 9%. And uh, then it went up, oh gosh, after that, it went way up after that. I think I had one for a while at 11%. Oh. The thing is, like Mateus is saying, just regarding residential real estate, if you lock in, a 30 year at, you know, two, 2.8%, then that's really good. So the only, the only thing I would question with Jason is he said he was doing adjustable, like a five, five, one. I thought, man, I did, knowing what I know about interest rates now, I have a 30 all day long is what I would go after. Especially right Be now. a little bit more upfront. Because okay. it may, maybe it'll lessen your return each month. But in the long run, man, it's it'll bring it in. I, I would agree with that right now, especially like if 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 they were more like I think he might have been buying you know, six years ago or something or, or five years ago. If they were closer to five, it might have been a yeah. little. Now, if he if he decides he did, he was his game plan is to sell it in five years, then that's fine. Sure, that's that's the way to go because then he's going to get the best possible interest rate and. Uh, and sell it in five years before it uh, has to reset. Well, I guess the thing is too, is depending on the condition of the property, see some of those he was talking about having to renovate. Um, Cause I've, you know, 
we'll see a lot of five five year when you're buying when they should be out of fix up and then refinance just yeah. because they're not going to qualify for that 30 year right um but yeah if you can get if you can get a i think what what is investment right now is it a percent higher do you know not off the top of my head i have to ask god but i think they're i think they're like just a, roughly a percent higher it's so like three and a half or so but still that's great yeah. Well, back in the 90s, it was only a quarter of a percent. <laughs> a quarter for, of the interest rate? Yeah, for the uh, for investment property. It, for, oh, oh, okay, gotcha. So yeah. if it was, uh, you know, 5% for a homeowner, it'd be five and a quarter for investor. Gotcha. Most okay. likely. Yeah. I don't think it's a whole point, but I think it, it was half or three quarters. Yeah. Yeah. And of course it depends. I think, you know, if you do 25% down, it's a little bit better, et cetera, but. Right. It's all negotiable to a certain point. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I've got to head off. Yeah. Thanks for joining Devin. Yeah. Thanks for joining Devin and we'll see you next month. Hopefully uh, I'll see if I can maybe get Paul on here. There you go. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Take care. We'll have a good night. All right. We'll see you. Thanks guys. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.